welcome everyone and welcome to Ben Fountain. Uh, I'm Sarah A. Lewis, executive editor of the Oxford American and host of our Point South podcast. And I'm really excited to have this time to sit down with Ben, whose story Cane Creek appears in our spring issue of the Oxford American. Ben is also the author of Beautiful Country Burn Again and Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. So thanks for being here, Ben. It's a pleasure. So we were really excited to publish your short, short story, Cane Creek, in the latest issue. And I, I don't often ask writers about their inspiration, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but I did discover during the fact check process that this piece was perhaps inspired by some true events. So maybe you could tell us, for those, of, for the, those folks who haven't actually read the story yet, um, what it's about and maybe why you thought it would be a good story to tell. Well, it came out of two things, particularly in my own experience. One of which was the death of my mother in February of 2018. And, um, uh, and, and the experience of that and the emotions that came out of that, both immediate and medium and long term, and then um, I have three sisters, and my little sister, uh, she lives on the coast of North Carolina, and um, and uh, she had an encounter with um, three uh, free-range dogs, much like the one I describe in the story, and um, and also there was a confluence of events right around that encounter that. Um, that basically I lift whole claw. Um, I mean, I'm a desperate writer. And so whatever comes to hand, um, I will try to find a use for. And, um, and sometimes stories, uh, you know, they, they come out of nowhere and, and aren't tethered to any particular personal experience. And then others, you know, are very much tethered to either my, experience or, or someone who I know. And so this is one of the latter where, um, where it, it's, it's very directly tied to my own experience. Well, this was a really fun and interesting edit for me because usually when we're doing fiction, like when we get to, cer to a certain point, we're thinking about characterization and structure and looking at some of the macro level issues of story and this story came to us with all of that already in place. And the things that I found that we were focusing on a little bit were like rhythm and some line level things that it almost felt to me like we were editing a poem in the way that we were looking at how punctuation worked to uh, convey meaning, the way that we were looking at the different placing of words. And so I was curious about your process of how the, those micro elements like choosing a semicolon over a comma or using italics rather than a quotation mark become part of your meaning making as a writer? That's a great question. Um, and it makes me happy that, that you say it felt like you were editing a poem. Um, and uh, I don't know, I can't articulate why that makes me happy, except I think poets are the pure, they're the purest. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, the concentration of language that you get in good poems is something I think all writers should aspire to, certainly fiction writers should aspire to, that maximum compression and concentration of meaning, which the good poets, they excel at. And, um, you know, it's so much of writing fiction, at least for me, you're going by instinct, intuition, feel, um, and, uh, uh, you know, over the years, hopefully you get better at it. Hopefully your instincts get better and your feel gets better. Um, and often for me, it's a sound. It's a sound in my head. It's, it's a particular story, a particular depiction of human experience is going to have its own sound and that's bound up in rhythm and pacing, you know, like you said, and, um, and, uh, and I think punctuation is a great tool 
for that, among other tools. Um, you know, why would you use a semicolon instead of a comma or instead of a colon? And um, these are very fine gradations, probably um, very fine distinctions, and yet they seem important. And, um, and so over the years, I've been doing this for a while, um, you know, I've learned to pay attention to that sound in my head and, um, and to try to get, get it on the page as closely as I can. So with a story like this, that seems something you can sustain, right? It's uh, less than a thousand words, I think, or around there. Um, and so you can think about it in terms almost like a poem uh, because it's compact and that maximum compre compression. Are you giving that same kind of attention to detail when you're doing a book length project? Yes. And it, it um, I can't do it otherwise. And many days I wish I could. Um, but I find myself, I mean, you know, we write the books that we're capable of and, um, and it seems this is the only kind of book I'm capable of possibly writing. And, uh, I mean, in Billy Lynn, it was very much, I mean, it, that book got built from the line out. Mm. I mean, you know, one phrase, one clause, one line, one sentence, then one paragraph. And, um, and I was very much feeling my way along. And, um, the couple of failed novels I have in the drawer, they, they were, you know, they, they were the same process. And, and certainly that's going on with the novel I'm working on now. And, um, you know, as I said, many days I wish that, uh, that I could, you know, more or less throw the words on the page and, and uh, let it, let the narrative just be and go. But, um, but I think so much matters in the way the words are put together and the, and the way the lines are formed. Um, it feels very important to me. And, um, and so it seems like I can't progress any other way. Yeah, it's interesting for me to hear you say this because um, I remember reading Billy Lynn, I've pr I probably ended up reading it the first time I read it about three times back to back to back to back because I kept feeling like I had this different reading of it each time. And so I'm hearing you talk about these, this attention to detail at the line level. And one of the things that I've always found fascinating about your work is the complexity of tone. That while the language is quite direct and accessible, the tone is often incredibly complex. And I've heard, I've seen interviews where you talk about the earnestness of that book. I, I don't know if that's, that still stands. And a lot of folks read that book as satire. Where do you, do you, where do you fall on that spectrum? You know, I don't a few think years it's satire out? at all. I think it's straight up realism. Um, and uh, I mean, show me a single thing in that book that hasn't happened or if it hasn't happened yet, it's probably happening right now right. or it's about to happen. I mean, we live in batshit crazy times and, um, and Billy Lynn is an attempt to depict one batshit crazy day in the life of a young soldier. And, um, and you know, the different tones that, that you mentioned, it's not me you know, just trying to see how much I can cram into a story or a paragraph or a line. It's me trying to stay faithful to my notion of what that experience would be. I mean, Billy and his squad mates are going through a very intense day and they're processing a lot of information. Um, and they're processing, I mean, not just current information, but recent experience, longer term experience and also they're holding in their heads what they're going back to you know they're going back to Iraq and so it's a very intense day for them and and I felt like you know from the level of the line on out the story needed to reflect that I'm wondering if there's like this sense of something being so earnest that it reads like satire um like there's some sort of postmodern 
element to that that I that I can't let go of. That's really interesting to think about. Um, you know, Billy, he's 19 years old. He is not very well educated. Um, but he's a pretty smart cat. And even more than that, it's like he's been shocked awake. The experience of combat, that life and death ultimate reality has, you know, burned the scales off his eyes. And so he's really looking at the world. And he's really thinking about things. He's really trying to make sense of things. And it's not an idle exercise because on some level his life may depend on it. I mean, is this a bullshit war? Should I go back to this war? I mean, what's the correct course of action? You know, where do I find, you know, some guidance in all this? And so he's looking at everything in, yes, the most earnest and sincere way, painfully earnest. And yet I think he's earned it. And, and I think it's justified because it may be literally a matter of life and death. And so, um, and, you know, he certainly doesn't have what he would consider a po what, I mean, he wouldn't know what a postmodern sensibility is. If, if, you know, you said, Billy, you know, your attitude is not postmodern at all. You know, it, it seems like quite something else. He, he would say, huh? You know, it's like, and um, I mean, that's not the world he comes from. He is himself. And, uh, uh, and you know, I wasn't thinking about those things when I was writing the book. I mean, I wasn't thinking postmodern, satire, irony. It was me. I mean, it's all I can do to try to get the experience right. Um, I, I'm a bear of little brain. I, I, I can't handle my, I can't handle more than that. And so, um, uh, you know, that was my writing of the book. If, if it's, if it's so earnest that it seems satire or postmodern, that would be an interesting thing to think about and maybe even to explore. I felt that actually, as I read, when we, we, um, accepted the the story and reading it the first time I was considering like how actually brave and difficult it would be to write that earnestly about a character because we're in close third person in Cane Creek and you're essentially writing into type you're finding someone who we know right who we someone who lives down the street from us someone who we know in the suburb and you're letting her think the things that we know that she thinks but in a lot of times in fiction and in movies, we're afraid to show her thinking. Um, like there are some almost, um, I wouldn't say cringeworthy moments, but like when the the husband, I, I believe he grabs a bat and he gets in the truck and you're like, oh gosh, don't, don't oh, do that. But that's, shotgun. yeah, he gets a shotgun and it's like, yes, that's what that person would do. So how do you find that balance between writing what's real and what's honest and what's true, but also having some element that, um, transcends that or feels surprising to the reader? Yeah. Um, again, I'm going by instinct and gut and what feels right. And um, it's not surprising to me that her husband would have a shotgun. Right. It's not surprising to me that he would have a truck, you know, a, I don't know what you would call it, a status truck, uh, a, uh, a toy truck, you know, because he's a businessman. He's obviously a successful executive, but they have this place out in the country. And, um, and so, you know, he has these things that bespeak of a country gentleman. Um, and, you know, I would be interested to know what kind of shotgun that is. I bet it's a pretty fancy shotgun. Um, you know, like that that magazine Garden and Gun, mm -hmm. you know, which is, it's, um, you know, something like that. And, uh, 
And, you know, as far as, you know, running the danger of venturing into cliche, you know, falling into cliche, um, you know, what is cliche? I mean, cliche, it doesn't challenge us. It plays to, you know, our assumptions about things. And, um, I mean, we do live in the world. And, and there's certainly, you know, certain patterns in the material world and also in our emotional world that hold true. And, um, and so given the context of, of these people, this woman and her husband, um, it feels pretty true to life to me that, um, you know, he would have this nice truck that he would drive a Mercedes to and from work. But when it comes time to protect his woman, you know, his, his turf, um, you know, he has to go get, he has to go find the keys to the truck. You know, and then he's ready to go off and hunt those dogs. Um, so, yeah, and as far as, her name is Sandra. <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, you forget their names. Um, uh, you know, she is an, a well-educated and aware woman. And so she's aware of herself thinking these things. She's aware of herself being aware. But how much does that help her? This is one of those moments in life where, where you know, she's aware of what she's going through and yet she's still floundering and flailing. I mean, this is one of those situations in life. It really has no answer. I mean, her mother died. There's no solution to death. There's no answer to death. And, um, and especially, you know, Americans in the early 21st century, we want to think everything has a solution. Everything can be solved or, or dealt with through therapy, uh, but some things can't be. And um, as I thought it was interesting, it would be interesting to explore her, you know, this very self-aware person, educated person going through this experience. I want to shift gears on this because I think this is a good segue into being, having the opportunity to ask you a kind of, existential question. Um, I know you recently contributed to Sewanee Review's um, Corona Correspondence, which is a series of letters written by you and Lauren Groff and a, a bunch of other writers just kind of responding to the times that we're in. And I would encourage anyone who hasn't already read them to seek them out at Sewanee Review. They're published online. Um, I read through a few of those today and I was curious to know how our current situation has informed or shaped your feeling of, of what your role as an artist is right now? Great question. Great question. And, you know, I've talked or emailed with, you know, some friends of mine who are writers, aspiring writers, you know, and they, and, and sometimes what I hear is, I feel like what I'm doing is so beside the point. Um, I mean, what use is it? I mean, it feels so trivial. And I'm trying to impress on them, this is just about the most important work we're doing. Okay, doctors, you know, medical people, you know, people who are trying to, to provide the material, you know, to, to take care of, of, you know, people who have who've been struck with this. Certainly that's the most important work right now. But a close second, I would argue, is the work of, of writers, poets, thinkers. Um, because, you know, things have causes. They don't come out of nowhere. And, um, and I think if, if the human race is going to make it, and if we're going to, you know, have decent lives for ourselves individually, and decent collective lives as a society in a country and, and in the world, it's absolutely imperative that, that 
we keep trying to make the most serious kinds of attempts to understand our own experience and to understand human nature and to understand why things are the way they are. And, um, and I think the artists are the best at doing that. They come the closest, they work the hardest. And um, so at this particular moment in time, when you know, you're, I'm looking at the news and I'm thinking, this is kind of like Hurricane Katrina, except for the whole country. I mean, we watched New Orleans dangle for 10 days, 14 days. You know, it, it was almost as if New Orleans was like in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And the United States was having great difficulty getting basic things to people that they needed to live. It was in the United States. I mean, you could drive down the interstate and get there. And so what was it about our society, our country, that left, you know, those people to dangle and in many cases to suffer terribly and to die? And, um, and so now we look around at, at, you know, our dysfunctional medical, you know, healthcare system, the, the very pressing immediate needs and deficiencies. And, uh, and these are the results of certain choices um, we've made as a society and certain choices that have been, you know, thrust upon us by people and forces more powerful than us. And, um, and it really, I mean, it's a matter of life and death. It is, this is an existential moment for, you know, the United States and for a lot of individuals in the United States. So I think, um, you know, it's the job of writers, poets, you know, painters, serious movie makers to see things for what they are and then try to find the means to express what they're seeing. And I think that's very crucial work. So do you find yourself knowing that we're currently in this very important socio-historical moment responding in time or are you pressing on with other work knowing that it will be important for your readership to have? It sounds pretty arrogant, doesn't it? I mean, in a way. The way I phrased it, yes, but feel well, free to I mean, word that. But you know, we have to be arrogant in a way. We have to presume that what we might come up with or stumble upon could be of use down the road. And that's especially hard when you're starting out doing this kind of work. It's like, who in the hell would want to read anything I write? Well, in the beginning, they won't. I mean, but that's the kind of writing we have to do to get to the point where maybe we'll do something worthwhile. But um, I wrote that, that short piece for Swanee Review, which, which um, I was really happy to do, and, and I was glad Adam Ross invited me. But um, I'm in the big middle of a novel set in Haiti um, in the early 90s. And as it happens, um, the setting of that novel is, takes place in, in the couple of years after a coup d'etat, um, where the democratically elected president was ousted um, in a coup d'etat by the military that, that was very heavily supported by U.S. government. And so Haiti, um, as part of sanctions against that military government, a very strict embargo is placed on the country. And um, it's not so dissimilar to what we're starting to live like now. And so I'm sitting there writing this novel that takes place in Haiti about 30 years ago. And, and I'm thinking, well, I mean, it doesn't feel irrelevant. Mm. Um, and, uh, and what I'm experiencing right now, um, I'll do what, what all writers do and, and try to go to school on that and, and see if I can't use it to make that story better, more authentic. And, um, more useful. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, it's like steady on, stay yeah. at your station, do your yeah. work. Well, I promised you 30 minutes, so I don't want to go over, but I think it'd be cool to end on a note about something that's been providing you some joy or comfort or ease, any book recommendations or songs or anything you're, you're digging right now? Yeah. Um, 
Let's see. Well, my wife and I just finished watching Babylon Berlin. The third Love season. that show. Yeah. Favorite show. Yeah, Favorite show. Do you watch uh, the dubbed version or the subtitled version? Subtitle. subtitle. Okay, you're better than I am. I watch the dubbed version. Yeah. Um, God, what a great show. And, uh, and so it's over now. And so you go through this period of mourning. I finished it three days ago and I haven't been the same. That's, that's about when I finished it. Yeah. Um, so you walk around with these people in your head, right? And yeah. it's like, I want more. So maybe we'll get another season. But um, let's see. I've been reading a lot about Haiti, um, you know, as background for the novel. Um, let's see. I was, you know, I read the New Yorker and the New York Review books. And Zadie Smith had a great piece on Carol Walker. Um, I think an issue ago for the New York Review of Books. I think Carol Walker is a great artist, period. Absolutely a great American artist. And, um, and her work terrifies me. But I think in all the right ways, all the appropriate ways, I, sh I mean, we should be terrified of a lot of things in our history and culture. For some reason, that gives me comfort. <laughs> I know, weird, but it, but it feels genuine, so genuine. And, um, and so, you know, reading Zadie Smith, who's one of the smartest, you know, writers around, on Carol Walker, and then going back and looking at my Carol Walker books and saying, yeah, this is real, this is authentic. Um, in this weird way, I mean, it, it's a comfort to me to see what, I mean, this is an artist making no compromises, and nor should she. I mean, she is going straight at something. And um, so I take a lot of comfort in art like that. And, uh, and right now it's Carol Walker. That's great. Well, Ben, thank you so much for being here. Um, Ben's story, Cane Creek, is in the latest issue of the Oxford American, which you all can pick up at OxfordAmericanGoods.org. And I also encourage folks to seek out Ben's books at their local indie, do curbside pickup, order it, and make sure that we're supporting our friends that way. Thanks so much, Ben. It was a great Sarah, pleasure to talk to you. It was a real pleasure, and thank you for publishing the story. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, Ben. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Sarah. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. We're signing off. Yep. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.